that as we begin this year together, we can just come and it's, uh, it's become commonplace in the last few months that we are in our own homes. We are kind of isolated from each other physically, but we're grateful that we can come together to this common place, uh, even if only through a screen, but also to be reminded that we are not alone, that we um, are part of a family and that we worship God with each other. And I think it, it becomes all the more important during this pandemic that we really take time to join a service like this and, you know, go to Bible study on Wednesdays because, um, for now, this is what we have, and it's the best that we offer. And um, if we can hold on to this even for a little while, we are reminded of the hope that uh, they will come. I believe it will be soon that we will gather once again in our home, in our, in, our, in you know our little uh, our little place of worship in Pacifica. And until that happens, we will continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. If you are just joining us, this is Bridgepoint Community Church, and we are so glad that you're joining us for our Sunday morning worship service. I'd like to begin this year by focusing our attention on the Word of God and see what direction and what uh, guidance we can get from it. And so our reading for today will come from the Epistle of James. If you're Following me in your Bible, James would be towards the end of the Bible, you know, not quite at Revelation yet, but a few books before that, before you find First and Second Peter, First and Second, Third John, uh, before all of that, you will find James. And so James chapter four, I will be reading from verses 13 all the way to 17. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You can follow along with me. This is what James wrote. He said, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that will disappear for a little time and then vanish. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, that is sin. Father, we thank you for your word. May you add your blessings upon our lives so that we might receive it with gladness and Holy Spirit. Empower us unto obedience, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question, and I think I know the answer to this. How many of you have had your plans ruined by 2020? You know, we look back and um, if you can go back to December 31, 2019, hours, you know, before a new year came and what were you anticipating would happen in 2020? What were your plans? What were your goals? You know, some of us plan to be more fit you know, to eat properly. Some of us, maybe we plan to read more, study more. I think many of us made plans to do more traveling and build memories. And then 2020 came and it went and we realized that a lot of plans never, never really came to fruition. And it's funny, it's quite ironic because entering into 2020, many of us were very sure of our plans. You know, the most common theme of organizations, even churches, a year ago was this whole thing of 2020 vision, right? 2020 vision. 2020 will bring about a clear uh, understanding of the future, clarity for the things to come. And how little did we realize that our claim to 2020 vision was really an arrogant claim to think that we understood it all and we knew everything that would happen. And God had a way of sort of humbling us and saying, you do not see the future. You have no understanding of what is to come, for that is only from the heart and the mind of God. I think if our anticipation in 2019 is that 2020 would give us 2020 vision, today, in January 3, 2021, the bigger lesson is hindsight is 2020. We only really understand things when we look back and we understand the lessons that we learn. Today, I'd like to talk about making plans and where that fits into the whole scheme of 
who is God and what is he to you? I think we've learned enough that no matter what our plans are and how good they seem to be, unless they are grounded on the will of God, our plans are often just a fantasy. And every plan that we have, no matter how well-intentioned or how good they seem to be, will never be fulfilled in and of itself simply because we uh, desired for it to be so. But we need to understand where to put it in its place. If I can give you a main point to this whole message today, it would be this, that the purposes of God are greater than your plans. The purposes of God are greater than your plans. Isn't that what we learned in the last year? We had planned to do so many things, but God had a different purpose. God had something else in mind. And hopefully that humbles us enough that as we enter into this new year, we will approach it with a different attitude, a different mindset, a different way of thinking about things, and understand that the plans of our minds and our hearts are not necessarily bad things, but they are subject to the sovereignty and the Lordship of Christ. So what I want to do is revisit this verse that we just read, James chapter 4. And I just want to make a few observations that will help us properly look forward to the year to come. Before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of a background of what the letter of James is all about. James, as we know, is written by the Apostle James, but probably not the one you're thinking of. You know, the James that we meet early in the gospel is the James, the brother of John. You know, so Jesus had this inner circle of Peter, James, and John. That's usually the James that we know. That's not the James who is writing this letter because that James died very early uh, in, in the story of the early church. If we look at the, uh, the book of Acts, uh, James was um, the first to be martyred among uh, the original apostles. Of course, Judas killed himself, so James would be the first to be martyred. He was, uh, he was killed. And so the next James we are introduced to in the book of Acts is actually James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, who happens to be um, the son of Mary and Joseph. In other words, the brother of Jesus. This James, the first bishop of Jerusalem in the first century, is the James we are talking about here. Now, why is this letter significant? Because Jerusalem, at the time that James is writing, has undergone tremendous persecution. And the result, or one of the results of persecution, is that the believers in Jerusalem left Jerusalem and they scattered and migrated in different parts of the world. In other words, James lost most of his church members. They were all in Jerusalem in the beginning. They were the early church. They were the first New Testament church. But because of all the trouble and all the persecution and all of the hardship, little by little, people were starting to leave Jerusalem. You know, I'm kind of feeling that a little bit as the pastor here in San Francisco. You know, in the last year or so, many people have been leaving the Bay Area. You know, we still consider them members of our church family, but they don't live among us anymore. They live in the other side of the bay or they live in another state or has just have moved out of the country. But in a way, I still feel a responsibility to, to shepherd uh, these brothers and sisters, to take care of them spiritually. And I can imagine that this is what James is going through. James has less members in his physical church in Jerusalem. Many of them have moved on. Many of them are in other countries and other parts of the world. But he still wants to shepherd them and he still wants to take care of them. And so this letter is written and it's intended to be read by all the people scattered around the world that were part of his church and are still part of his church. And he wants to remind them of a few things. And so when we get to James chapter 4, James is going to give them words of wisdom on how to plan and how to look forward to the future. And this is especially interesting because, and many of us who are, who are immigrants understand this, when you are in a new land, when you move to a new place, 
you have plans, you have dreams. You know, those of us that came to the United States, for instance, from the Philippines, we came with a dream in our heart. We came with a desire to experience things, plans to, to prosper and to grow and to experience things that we did not experience in our homeland. Well, the members of James are experiencing the same. They're in a new country, they're in a new territory, they're in uncharted territories, and they want to prosper and they want to do well. And so in James chapter 4, especially verses 13 to 17, I think James is speaking particularly to the listeners or the readers of this epistle who are making business plans, pl plans to, to be established in their livelihood, plans to prosper, to make it big, to be rich, to leave an inheritance for their children. But he wants to give them some caution and he wants to give them words of advice. And if you find yourself in that situation, we've just gone through the first, you know, sort of almost full year of a pandemic. We're still in the middle of it. But even as we look forward to the end of the pandemic, aren't we all making plans? We're making plans again to, um, if you lost a job, to find a better job. If you are, um, if you're struggling through your employment right now to see what else is out there. Maybe some of you want to go back to school. I know all of us want to travel again. So we're making these plans to go to Hawaii and Europe or maybe back to the Philippines. We all have plans, just as the members of James had plans. But I think that just as James warned them about making plans, we need to listen to the wisdom of James today. So five quick observations I would like to make from this passage. Observation number one is that it is, it is a given that we all make plans. We all make plans. Look at verse 13. Some of you say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. That was the plan. For many people that James was writing to, that may have been their plan. I will use this year. I will go somewhere. I'm going to start a business. I'm going to establish myself and be economically viable, and then I will make a profit, and I will be rich. Look at how, how precise this plan is that, that James is talking about. He says, some of you are saying, today or tomorrow, you have this time element. You know, you're know, you looking at the opportunity is now. And then he says, I will go into such and such a town. You even have a location in mind. Not only at the opportunity, but where is the best a place to do it, you know? Um, is it best to do business in the Bay Area? Is it best to do transactions with other countries, with other corporations? So you're thinking of the opportunity, but you're also thinking of the locality, the location. And then the plan, it says that I will spend a year there. You even have this, you're giving yourself this period in which to see if your plan will prosper. You're looking for landmark moments to see if, if this is making sense. And then you're your, uh, your ultimate goal is, when I do so, I will make trade and make a profit. All of our plans are always for something good, right? We never plan for destruction. We never plan for evil. We never plan for anything that is a disadvantage to us. Every time we plan, it is always for something that we believe is good. We plan so that we can make more money. We plan so that we can build memories. We plan so that we can see the world. We plan so that we can have better health. All of our plans always result in what we believe to be something good. But did you notice something missing in the plans in verse 13? Today or tomorrow, I will go to such and such a place. I will spend a year there. I will make trade and I will make a profit. What is missing in those plans? Did you notice that God is not in it? There's no mention of God's desires, God's purposes. It's, it's all about me. Today, I will go somewhere. Today, I will spend a year in this place. Today, I will engage in trade. In the end of this year, I will make a profit. It is all about me. And maybe that's the problem with our plans. They're too small. They're too self-centered. They don't involve God. And maybe 2020 was a year where God kind of shook us a little bit and said, hey, let's not forget who is sovereign here. Let's not forget that I'm not simply someone you add to my plan, to your plans. I ought to be at the center of your desire to do what your life should be about. You know, 
we shouldn't second guess. We shouldn't presume to know the will of God. We should only hope to discover it as he reveals it to us. You know, in the late 1800s, there was a Methodist bishop, and in one of his sermons, he said, man will never fly. Human flight is impossible because if God intended for us to fly, he would have made us with wings. And in that sermon, he said, it is simply not God's will for humans to fly. You know the name of that bishop? His name was Bishop Milton Wright, and he had two sons, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Why do we know Orville and Wilbur? Because in 1903, they successfully flew the first motorized airplane at Kitty Hawk. Isn't that interesting? That the bishop who said man will never fly ended up having two sons that started this whole idea of flight for all of us. We should never presume to know exactly what God's will is. That's a form of arrogance when we say, oh, only this can happen, only that can happen. God can only use this person. God cannot use that person. We shouldn't be in a place where we presume to know. We must be in a place where we want to know. And so, yes, we all make plans, but our plans cannot only be about ourselves. My second observation is that we have virtually little control over most things in life. We have very little control over things. And the more we understand that, the more we realize why God needs to be part of this picture. In verse 14, uh, James said, you make all these plans, yet you do not even know what tomorrow brings. For what is your life? Your life is a mist. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes. You know, James talks about the, the brevity of life, how insignificant it is in light of eternity. You know, you and I, we make plans as if our lives are so big and so meaningful and it's all that. We make plans as if if we make our first million, our second million, our first billion, that that is what life is all about. But James says, what is a million? What is a billion when you only live to be, you know, 80 years old, 70 years old, 90 years old, 100 the most? And that is such a small amount of time in light of eternity. We make plans as if they are big, and yet we don't understand very often that there's so much we don't control. So be careful about making plans as if it's all under your control. You know, when we lose control, we lose our mind because we figure, if I can't control something, then how can I be sure? How can I hope for the future? But the truth of the matter is everything we do is an act of trust. You know, whenever you ride an airplane, how much control do you actually have? You sit there, you strap yourself to a seat, and then you let go. It's now in the hands of the pilot. It's now in the hands of the weather. It's now in the hands of the laws of aerodynamics that that plane will, will fly. It, you're, you're, all, you're all just trusting that nothing bad will happen to that flight. You really have no control. It's kind of like, you know, it kind of reminds me of a cruise that, that uh, Anna and I took, you know, several years ago. In 2018, Anna and I went on a cruise. We took our outlaws, I mean, our in-laws with us. Um, and um, we wanted to do this Mediterranean tour. And so we were, we landed in Barcelona. We were going to hit three spots in Italy. We were going to go to France. Um, to You were going to Monaco. We would visit different places. And the first stop leaving Barcelona was we were going to go to Naples. And I was so excited about Naples, uh, number one, because, you know, I'm, I'm part Italian. And so our, my Italian side of the family is from the south of Italy. So, you know, it's possible that I was hoping maybe I might meet a Michiano there, right, or something like that. But I, I was also excited about Pompeii because... I had always, as a child, read about Pompeii and the story of Mount Vesuvius and the ruins of Pompeii. So I was so excited about going to Naples and making that trip to Pompeii. But as we were traveling down the Mediterranean in the middle of having breakfast, the captain said on the loudspeaker, um, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we are faced with a storm between us and Naples, and we will have to bypass Naples and turn around spend a few uh, hours more in, on, in the sea and then just end up in our second port in Rome. And I remember thinking, 
wait, wait. I, I said, does that mean we're not? Does that mean we're not going to Naples? I mean, we planned this for years. And and um, you know, Anna looked at me and said, it, "Ed, it's not going to happen." And I, you know, I I wanted to do something. I wanted to turn the ship around. I wanted to call the captain directly and say, "You just don't understand. This is the plan. We're supposed to see Naples." But no matter what I tried, no matter what the plans I had, no matter what alternatives I thought of, I realized this was out of my control. There was nothing I could do. In this trip, Naples is not going to happen. But you know what? Such is life. That's 2020 in a nutshell, isn't it? Virtually everything we planned, the loudspeaker said, not going to happen, at least not this year. How come? Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't understand the future. You know, I'm, I'm even thinking, and I... I, I don't want to be political, so I'm not going to approach this from a political point of view. I will approach this from a, uh, a prophetic point of view. In the middle of this year, many so-called prophets predicted who would win the election in November of 2020. And they were so sure. They would say, this is the guy who would win. This is God's will, that this is the candidate who would win. And yet it didn't happen. And yet these people were prophets, or at least they claimed to be. They pretended to be, maybe, but that's what they put themselves at. They said, God said to me, this is the result of such and such and so and so. But it didn't happen. How come? Because no one knows the future. No one can presume to know exactly everything that is in the mind of God. God gives us hints, and God gives us clarity in certain things, but no one in its absolute sense knows what lies ahead, only God. And so we must be careful about making plans and pretending that we know how exactly everything will transpire. My third observation is that because of everything I said so far, we must then recognize the sovereignty of God in everything. Look at verse 15. Instead, in other words, instead of saying all those things, I plan to do this, I plan to do that, James says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, then we will live, and then we will do this, and then we will do that. What is James saying? It's not bad to plan. It's not bad to say, we will do this, we will do that, but you must make the first statement. The first statement is, if it is God's will, if it is God's will. Then we will do this, and then we will do that. You see what James is saying? He's not asking you to abandon your dreams. He's not asking you to never look forward to anything, but he's asking you to put all your plans in the right place, and that's under the sovereignty of God. You know, when my dad was, um, when I was young and my dad was still flying with the airlines, he would go to many places, you know, he would leave the house and that, that he would say, I'm on my way to the US, I'm on my way to Europe, or I'm on my way to Hong Kong or wherever. And I would always ask my dad, dad, when are you coming back? You know, when do you get back? Because depending on where his trip was, he would spend, you know, different amount of days there. My dad, even back in the 70s and 80s, he would always say, God willing, I'll be home on Thursday. Or another time he would fly to the US and I'd say, dad, when would you come back? And my dad would say, God willing, in a week, I'll be back. God, my dad always said that, God willing, God willing. And I never understood that as a kid. I didn't even understand where he came up with that term. Like, what is God willing? You know, God willing this, God willing that. But I guess many years ago, somebody taught this lesson to my dad so that it became part of his language. You know, when, when my dad would say, God willing, we'll, we'll visit this place next week, or God willing, this is what will happen to us in five years. My dad kind of understood that, and, and it was part of how he spoke. And I guess as a result of that, I've kind of picked up the habit myself. You know, so when, when I make plans, I make plans for Bridgepoint. You know, there's many things I want this church to accomplish, but I have to say to myself, God willing. This is what Bridgepoint will accomplish. When Anna and I make plans to travel, we, I, I say, God willing, I'll visit this place or that place. Because James reminds us that when we make plans, our plans are subject to the sovereignty of God. So we must say, if God wills, 
if God wills, then it will be so. The fourth observation is that we must guard against pride. Verse 16 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. What is, what is arrogant? When we, when we make a statement about the future as if we know it all and that we are in control of it all, we boast. And when we boast, we engage in activity that is evil, pride. Pride is a very big problem. You know, I said earlier that the problem with many of our plans is, is about us. I want to do this. I want to gain that. I want to go here. I want to amass this much wealth. But life is not about us, and the world does not center around us. We are not the center of the universe. God is. And only when we make God the center will we understand our place. Isn't it interesting that boasting is something we're told not to do? The word boast here in the, in the book of James, it comes from a, a New Testament word that literally means proud confidence in one's own knowledge and in one, one's own cleverness. Being proud in your knowledge and boasting about how clever you are. You know, saying, because I know, because I'm smart, because I'm knowledgeable, because I'm educated, I know this is what, go what is going to happen. That's the kind of boasting the Bible tells us not to do. How come? Because only God knows, and only God is ultimately wise. Did you notice that of the Ten Commandments, the first is not even a commandment? That's why the, the Jews don't call it the Ten Commandments. They call it the Decalogue or the Ten Words, because... Number one is not a command. Number one is a word. And what is that word? I am the Lord, your God. That's the first word. I am the Lord, your God. And then all the other commandments build on that. The law, following God's ways, understanding what's right and what's wrong, it hinges on that one acknowledgement. He is the Lord, our God. Until he is the Lord your God, then none of your plans mean anything. None of your behavior counts for anything. Even the works that you consider good are futile because they don't hinge on the idea that he alone is Lord over all. But when you acknowledge the first word, I am the Lord your God, then it makes sense that you have no other gods before him. It makes sense that you keep the Sabbath holy. It makes sense that you honor your father and mother. You don't steal. You don't kill. You don't commit adultery. You don't bear false witness. You don't covet your neighbor's goods because you have first acknowledged that he is the Lord your God. And maybe we are invited this morning that before we make plans for 2021, before we presume to think we know what will happen by the end of this year, maybe the first order of business is to ask in our hearts, is he the Lord my God? Is he my master? Is Christ my savior? Is he seated at the throne of my heart? Have I conceded to his lordship? Have I surrendered to his will? Because anything short of that is arrogance, and arrogance, James says, is evil. One final observation in verse 17, we must do what is right. In verse 17, he says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, that is sin. James is saying we don't know the future, but God makes it known to us in his time and in his way. And as God makes his, know, his will known to us, we must do what we know to be his will. James is dealing with a very interesting sin here. You know, many weeks ago, one of our Wednesday Bible studies, we were talking about sin, and I said that there's two kinds of sin. There's the sin of commission, and there's the sin of omission. And the sin of commission is when you do things you shouldn't. But there's also this other kind of sin called the sin of omission. It's when you don't do the things that you should. And many of us, we are very careful about the sin of commission. You know, we, we don't do this. We know we don't engage in that behavior. We stay away you know, from doing things. You know, we, um, we, we, we try to avoid, you know, this and that. But it's not just the avoid.
avoidance of things. The question is, are you avoiding to do the right things also? Are you too passive when you know that something needs to be done? And James is reminding us, obeying God's will is not just not doing things. It's not just the thou shalt not. It's also the thou shalt. What should we do? What shall we do? And if we know something to be right, but we don't do it, then James says, well, that is sin. And so his final admonition to us is, do what is right. Know what is right and do what is right. You see, the problem with the sin of omission, um, Joel Ryan in, a, in an article in Christianity.com said, the sin of omission denies believers the blessing of obedience. You see what he's saying? When we commit the sin of omission, when we fail to do what we should, we deny ourselves the blessing of obedience because Blessings come as we obey, right? You know, when we align ourselves to the will of God, that's when we experience the fullness of everything that is good that he brings to our life. And when we are, when we are you know, not doing anything, when we are apathetic to things, then the blessings of God are beyond reach, not because God is not willing to give it, but because we're not willing to go where the blessing is. And so... As we face this year, let's remind ourselves, it's not about making plans as much as it is acknowledging that the purpose of God is greater than my plan. And therefore, I must surrender to his purpose. And then the plan will happen according to his will. There's a couple of ways to make plans. We can either just make a plan and do it, or we can make a plan and ask God to bless it. But I think there's a third and better way. And the missionary Hudson Taylor put it this way. He said, a better way of working is to begin with God to ask what are his plans and to offer ourselves to him to carry out his purposes. You see what Hudson Taylor is saying? He says, the problem with us is we make plans and we say, God, can you bless this plan? We say, here's what I want. God, can you approve it? And Taylor says, what if instead of doing that, you come to him empty and you say, God, what are your plans? What, what do you want for this world? What do you want for our church? What do you want for your kingdom? And then put in my hand your purpose. Because once you put your purpose in my hand, then that's the plan. The plan is to do the purpose of God. And so I want to challenge you this year, before you make plans, before you arrogantly pursue what you think will happen, maybe today is a day of surrender to say, God, show me. I humble myself. I ask that you reveal to me the beauty of your son, the salvation that you give, and the plans and purposes that you have in my life. I'd like to close with a proverb that has been very meaningful to me and I'm sure to many of you. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And as you surrender your plans and your ways to the will of God, may the purposes of God truly stand for you and with you in this year to come. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we are grateful that you're a God who knows all things, who orders all things, and is in control of everything. And before we make plans for ourselves, our desire this morning is to know your purpose. Show us the purpose of your salvation as you reveal Christ crucified and raised from the dead. May we be surrendered to your way of redemption, your path of salvation. We surrender to Jesus, our Savior. We ask that the work of the cross be applied to our lives, that you wash us by the blood of Jesus, that you lift us up from where we are, forgive us from our sins, and teach us to walk in your, in your presence, but also to lead us because we choose to also obey you as Lord, not to set out the path for ourselves, but to discover the path that you are laying for us. So before we say, I will do this today and tomorrow, that I will prosper here and there. This morning, we say instead, God, would you reveal to us your purpose? 
would you show us your plan? And then would you find that as I am empowered by your spirit, I will walk in obedience. Bless the work of our hands. Bless the path that our feet will take. And most of all, may your blessing be upon the people that we love, the people of this world, and everyone, I pray, will come to know you as Savior and Lord, as we do, all for your glory, that the name of Jesus Christ will be lifted up always. In his precious name we pray, amen and amen. Well, I pray that this has been a good start of the year for us. We have, you know, about 51 Sundays more to go this year. Only God knows what those Sundays will look like. I am praying that one of those Sundays will mark the day that we will be back in Pacifica in our building. But until that day happens, we will continue to seek his purpose, understand his ways, and surrender to his plan. So thank you for joining us on uh, on, on Facebook or Zoom. If you're joining us on, on Facebook, by the way, a quick announcement. For the next three Wednesdays, we are not going to be on Facebook Live. Uh, instead, we will be having three Zoom-only Wednesday night meetings. So if you normally join us on Wednesday on Facebook, um, please make plans to join us on, on Zoom. We will be more than happy to give you the link if you send us a message because we have some interactive meetings going on and it just doesn't work well on Facebook. Uh, but towards the end of January, we will return to our Wednesday night uh, Facebook Live Bible Studies. As far as Sundays is concerned, we're always on Zoom. We're always on Facebook. That doesn't change. So we're grateful that you are joining us. So um, before we say goodbye to those on you on Facebook Live, please check out our website, bridgepointcc.com. You can learn more about our church, but also how you can partner with us in ministry by supporting the work of Bridgepoint through your giving. And uh, we won't see you on Facebook this Wednesday, but we will see you on Zoom. But definitely, if you'd like to join us next Sunday, we will see you on Facebook Live. And for now, goodbye. Have a great start of the new year. And may God's blessings be upon each and every one of you. God bless you all. For those of you that are continuing here on Zoom, uh, just a few announcements.